Uh, so my name is Rebecca Healand. I work as the manager of barcoding reform. I also work with the Bloodnet and ABDR support teams. Um, and I'll be giving a presentation and a little bit about you know, what's the policy that we have and what's happening in the space. Then we'll be lucky enough to hear from Gary who works at GS1 and he'll be talking about the standard, um, the GS1 standard that we are um, asking everybody to abide with. And then um, we have a presentation from Novo, but unfortunately un nobody is able to be here to represent Novo, so they sent me through some slides. So I'll be presenting on their behalf. And then we'll hear from Tara at Baxalta, and then we'll hear from Louise at Pfizer, Ryan at Griffles, and David from CSL. Um, we'll have some time for questions after each presentation, and then we can also go through some questions at the end of the, the whole section. So barcoding, re barcoding reform, um, so why? Why are we doing a reform? Uh, we're doing the adoption of the ISBT 128 data matrix and the GS1 data, eight data matrix aims to enhance um, safety and supply and sec security, improve inventory management and financial sustainability, increase efficiency and facilitate global compliance and ben benchmarking. So this isn't a new topic of discussion. It has been discussed since roughly 2007 in the blood sector in Australia. So we, um, there was an initial proposal to move to ISBT 128 and GS1, um, which did include a meeting on the side of HAA like we're doing right now. 2012, there was public consultation and draft requirements for ISBT 128 data matrix and the GS1 data matrix undertaken um, by the National Blood Authority. And in 2014, we, um, the specif specifications for the barcoding reform were approved by the Jurisdictional Blood Committee, which of course is made up by um, members from each state and territory across the, across the nation. So what is our barcoding standards available on our website at blood.gov.au forward slash barcoding and it was published um, on the 5th of September in 2014. And it's mandatory for all blood products funded under the national blood arrangements to move towards the ISBT 128 data matrix for fresh blood products. And I know maybe a few of you did hear a great presentation from Dimi at the blood service about where that's going and um, what's happening with that this morning. Today we'll be focusing on the GS1 data matrix for all manufactured products and there are contractual obligations for all commercial suppliers to move to these new symbologies. So why are we moving to 2D rather than linear? Well it's two-dimensional two is standard now for healthcare and the ability to fit a great deal of information on the 2D small barcode um, including multiple fields that can be read in a single scan. So you can see a picture there, the data matrix can take up all of that information. So there is the ISBT128 data matrix um, and that will be, um, uh, that um, symbology will be um, moved towards from the blood service for all fresh and fresh blood products um, and that the timings for that are around 2017 um, which Dimi outlined this morning and then the trans for transition label and the new label and then 2019 for moving over to the full label, um, which is, as I mentioned there, and the original timelines have been extended, but that's due to the um, complexity of, the, of this new data matrix. So the GS1 data matrix is mandated for the National Product Catalogue from NITA, and once the transition is complete, there'll be no linear barcodes, only the data matrix. It'll be on the vial and it'll be on the carton and in the long term there will also be serialisation. So the timing for GS1 is for transition labelling to commence in January of next year, which is why the timing of this forum is um, happening now so we can all um, have an update as to what is happening with products and the timings for those transition labelling for each product. Um, January 2017 is when serialisation will commence and then January in 2018 the transition labelling can cease. So these timings are for products off the manufacturing line and not at the distribution time so we can add up to approximately six months. So steps 
um, that we think that health providers need to undertake at this time to begin getting ready. So we need to start talking to software vendors um, and I know that there are a few software vendors here today and the MBA is also talking with quite a number that work across the country. You need to talk to your internal health service ICT um, to make sure that you can take in the 2D barcodes in your facility. If replacing barcode scanners, there is you need to start looking at the um, purchasing of 2D imaging scanners and have a look to see whether the barcode scanners that you already have can take the 2D image because it's more likely um, that you already can read those 2D barcodes that scanners. Uh, review your business processes to see if there'll be any impact and always keep looking at our page blood.gov.au forward slash barcoding. We've put as many resources as we can um, on, on that page. Try to keep everybody updated as to what's happening across the centre and at the moment have some trial barcodes on there that you can test with your scanner to see whether that is um, working or not. So I'd like to welcome up um, to, up to the podium, Gary Russon. He's a senior advisor for healthcare sector for GS1, and he's going to give us an overview about um, about the standard. So, thank you, Gary. I'll just get you to clip that on. Okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so for context, uh, I've been with GS1 for just over a year now and prior to that spent um, 12 years with a pharmaceutical and medical device supplier. Um, GS1 is an organisation, we've got um, over 110 member organisations globally, so that is a GS1 location um, across the globe that helps uh, industry implement GS1 standards, which is anything from barcodes to um, data with respect to the data pool that we have. Um, over 5 billion barcodes scanned every day, so GS1 covers various industries including um, food and beverage, so everything going through your Coles, um, Woolworths supermarkets is um, GS1 barcoded. So that's why we're getting up to that 5 uh, billion, edging on 6 billion scans a day. We're a member-driven organisation, so we're neutral, not-for-profit, so um, we basically run off member fees. Member fees are based on turnover bands as well, so if you're not already a GS1 member, um, we can provide advice on uh, what those costs would be for your organisation based on local turnover. So GS1, uh, our basic beliefs are to create a common um, business language um, so that we're all talking the same with regards to standards. So um, often in presentations to new members, we talk about shoe sizes or um, plugs and all the variables you have across the globe and all the different adapters and everything you need to translate that information. And ultimately, what GS1 are doing is outlaying a um, one set of standards for everyone to work to that covers all industries. So for healthcare, we, we work with a subset of all the global standards that are specific to the industry. So through the use of barcodes, um, when capturing um, information such as a, an identifier, so a barcode number, that can link back to um, the plethora of data within our uh, global data synchronization um, data pool, basically. So, um, as touched on earlier in Rebecca's slides, we're um, looking at um, two forms of barcode, so I'll obviously be talking GS1 data matrix, um, so the um, application of that both the unit and um, all levels of packaging, such as the unit vial, the pack, the carton, and the barcodes are applicable. Um, and um, the elements that will be built in, so this is um, as mandated by the MBA, is the GTIN. So um, for some of you who don't know GS1 
formerly they're known as EAN or EAN Australia. So EAN as a term is European article number. So just one really went through a bit of a, a rebrand um, in terms of the global uh, view that they have. So GS1 being global standards. Um, the EAN is commonly known as now the GTIM, so the global trade item number. So on any retail item, a bottle of water, that 13-digit um, number, usually starting with a 9 um, within Australia, is the, um, is the GTIM. Within the barcodes, such as the data matrix, the GS1 data matrix, we can build in additional attributes. Um, so in relation to today's presentation, we're talking expiry date, batch or lot number, and serial number. There's a whole host of additional attributes that can be built in as well. Um, so it is always worth reviewing that in terms of what additional benefits you could build in as a business um, to those barcodes. So as we've seen, this is what a data matrix lo looks like. My slides are to a different ratio, so they are looking um, like a rectangle. It's actually a square. And encoded in this particular data matrix is um, the GTIN, an expiry date, lot number, and a serial number. So through, through the application of um, data matrix, you, you're looking at a code that can be you know, less than half a mil square. Um, yeah, half a mil, yeah. Um, no, five mil, sorry, five mil square. Um, and as a code, it actually grows larger the more data you build in. So we're looking at four attributes. If you were to build in six, seven, it's going to start to grow because it's holding more information. So the, um, as I touched on, the JS1 data matrix holds um, a large amount of data. So it's quite different to that normal linear retail barcode, which is just holding a number. Um, it allows the printing of the variable data. So normally static is your GTIN. So a GTIN is allocated to a product and a its particular tier of packaging, and that is repeatable across all the units. Um, your variable information is your, your batch and expiry specific to the batch. And then the serialization then makes each individual unit unique. Um, going forward through um, some global work requests, we're also looking to build in um, the use of URLs as well. So within healthcare, um, you know, uh, an instructional video to, to take the user um, to give further guidance on the use of that product um, will also be a um, possibility. So in terms of resources from a GS1 perspective, we, we can ultimately provide guidance to existing members or non-members. Um, in, in terms of whether it's to do with membership. So membership with GS1 really gives you a barcode prefix. So that is a range of numbers to apply to your products. Um, so that's key in this. If you're not an existing member, then please contact us to discuss that further. The GS1 data matrix guidelines. So this document is um, a multi-page PDF that gives you a good overview of what the code um, what the barcode is, what's contained within it, and certain considerations that you need to have. So it's um, it's quite good for a you know for a project team to review and get an understanding of what's going to be required. The third link there is to our general specifications document. So that is a gl global document. It's quite lengthy. However, there are sections that are specific to the GS1 data matrix. Um, where this is a, a very important um, guidance document is that you can um, work through where your products are going to go, what kind of environment they'll go into, um, and ultimately what kind of size and parameters your GS1 data matrix needs to be on your products. So again, from a project perspective, review of, of that um, particular document is, is quite key. And if you need further clarity when working through it, because it can be quite complex, um, JS1 are there to support, whether it's by phone, email, or even um, visits. So barcode scanners. Um, 
yes, they need to be capable of scanning 2D barcodes. So um, some manufacturers may already have those in place. Um, traditionally, linear, li linear scanners have been in place. Um, if you do need to review um, and invest in new scanners, then GS1 does have a, a solution providers directory. So that is organizations that provide these services that ultimately have been reviewed by GS1 um, to ensure that they can meet and apply our standards within their technologies. And that directory is on our website, the link you'll see um, bottom left there. So we, we will ultimately leave it for organizations to review those um, solution providers independently. Um, we will we won't give you a, a preference of one or the other. The same applies for the barcode quality verifiers. So again, with the verifiers, it's needed to ensure that they can scan and verify 2D barcodes. And ultimately, they will give you a, um, a grading um, in relation to the ISO standard um, to ensure that the codes that you're generating um, are compliant and, and meet the, the standards. Um, so that's quite important as well. So again, we've got Solution Provide Directory that has um, businesses that can help um, you review and implement those kind of technologies. Uh, GS1 and Sales, we do a lot of barcode verification, but mainly in the retail space, so all the suppliers going into the Coles or Woolworths, as mentioned earlier, um, all require barcode verification reports um, to be provided to the likes of Coles. Um, within healthcare, that's not the case. Um, however, we do have a verification service available for data matrix codes. Um, there's low demand at the moment because, you know, it's, it's Gradually, um, its presence is getting greater within healthcare, so we will have a more, um, a more formal process in terms of requesting these um, reports. For now, we just have a, um, an email address that so goes to our Sydney office who can um, provide a report which will give you a bit of guidance in terms of how close you are to meeting that ISO standard and it will grade the barcodes for you. So the, the question, what's in it for me? So as um, Rebecca also touched on, ultimately this is to improve um, patient safety. It will also bring efficiencies across all the organizations. Um, so in implementing these standards and the barcodes, you know, don't just see it as it's for the MBA. You can use them internally to your advantage as well. Um, the, um, also the global standards, so with regards to um, the reference of loading the product data to the National Product Catalogue, which is a local data pool within Australia. Um, supplying your information to that can not just be for the MBA. If you've got other trading partners, you, we've got the likes of Health Person Victoria, HealthShare New South Wales, um, private hospital groups, all, all recipients to that data pool. Um, so already we have, um, I think it's 350,000 GTINs roughly um, within, that, within that data pool that is being shared between all those trading partners. Um, in terms of contact and for additional guidance, we have a, um, a healthcare team email address. So that, that um, consists of myself who is based in Melbourne and I look after a few states. I've got a counterpart up in Sydney who looks after New South Wales, uh, ACT, Northern Territories. Um, so as I said, we can provide guidance um, via email, via phone, and we can also do um, visits um, pending location. Now, um, I've not discussed too much the National Product Catalogue in, in too much detail. That would be an, another presentation uh, entirely. However, do reach out to us for further information on that and we can um, take you through um, what the National Product Catalogue involves with regards to the data and the method by which you actually upload data and um, publish that to trading partners. So that's pretty much me for today. Um, are we doing questions at the end? Okay. Thank you.
Wonderful. Okay, so I'm just going to give some update on behalf of Novo, who present, who sent through some slides um, with updates about what's happening with Novo 7. Uh, the contact, if anybody is interested in asking any specific questions, would be Rowan O'Brien, and he's their regulatory affairs and um, QA manager. So in regards to um, Novo 7, we'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the scope, proposed labelling changes and timing of the implementation. So the scope for Novo is um, obviously they have Novo 7 supplied in those four presentations. Um, each carton has um, an individual unit, um, contains the vial, the pre-filled um, syringe and the adapter. And the project scope includes only the label of powder vial component and the unit carton. So their proposed label changes come in three stages. Stage one is the transition labelling, which is the addition of the 2D um, matrix barcode. So they will have the human readable GTIN that has just been outlined a bit by Gary, um, where the, um, the 2D barcode will contain the GTIN, the expiry, expiry batch, um, and will have a human readable batch and expiry printed in that blue field and that they will still remain, the current linear barcode will remain as per their transition labelling requirements. Um, the stage one transition labelling will include um, the addition of the 2D matrix barcode to the powder vial label and it will include the, the GTIN only. So you can see there that it will have the GTIN and um, it won't have the human readable um, format there. That will be on the container. Stage two of the implementation will include the serialisation um, um, added to the 2D matrix barcodes and there will be a change only to the carton, not to the powder vial label. And then there's stage three which is the deletion of the current linear barcode and that will be outlined on the timing. So the stage one will be occurring, um, the first batches will be hitting in the first half of 2016 across Australia. So that would be the tr new transition label and the existing barcode will remain. Stage three will be the um, serialisation on the, on the product and they will be sent through in the quarter four of 2017. Uh, they will reach Australia, but they will be out with the customers in quarter four. Stage three will be the deletion of the linear barcodes, um, and the first batches will be expected to be sent through to the Australian customers in 2020 without that um, current barcode on it. That's all from Novo. Did anybody have any questions that I could answer? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> But if you do have any questions, please let me know and I'd be very happy to forward them through to Rowan or get him to be in contact with you. So happy for you to ask me now or come and approach me after the presentations are complete. Hi, how are you going? I might just put you on hold there and Donna's just going to give you a, uh, a microphone. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you please explain the on the Yeah. Yeah, okay, so they do need to put on serialisation onto the vial from um, the MBA's perspective, but at this time Novo can't um, give an update as to how and when that will occur. So that's why they haven't presented that information now because it's still something that they're looking into, which of course they have the time because it's not required until 2017. So I think it'll be something that they can give an update on at a later date. Correct. Correct. That's correct. For Nova, it will be on the carton, but it needs to be on the vial also. That's right, but they will update us about that at a later date. No problem. Okay, any other questions I can help with? If not, I will invite Tara from Baxalta to come up to the front and she's going to give you a um, update as to what's happening with Max Alter. Thanks. Just just click that on. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you. Um, so at Baxalta we've not only got barcoding changes, we'll also have some rebranding changes that will come at the same time. So I've got some pictures of the, the new boxes uh, through here. 
Ad rate isn't really going to change very much to begin with. Uh, as you can see, the code is on the top of the vial. That's current process at the moment with the 2D, so that's going to remain. The only change you will see is on the top of the box where you've got the linear barcode, we will be adding the human readable and the 2D, so that will be right on top, both of them will be there. The Baxter branding will remain on Advate for a little while longer, probably about another year. Uh, the vial itself, as I said, it won't be any changes on the actual label round the bottle it'll because it's already there the only change will be in the format of the expiry date because currently we've got it with um, ma uh, the month uh, the day the month and the year so with the the new change to year month day that's the only change that you will see in the human readable part of the advate so this is where we see the new rebranding. So we have Saproton here. I've just put one of the sizes up that you can see. So the, the box itself, again, it will be on the top. And speaking with our product um, managers, the, the linear label that is on Saproton is currently just a packaging label. It's not actually being utilized by our customers in any way. And we have spoken to those who buy Saproton. It is actually um, manually put into their system. So we've had in discussions with them, we're going straight to the 2D. There's no need to do any transition labeling on this product because, the, as I said, linear is not being utilized. And you'll see that on the vial itself, we've added in the human readable with the GT and the expiry date and also the uh, lot number so that will be on the product and that will be on the label it won't be on the the top of the bottle in any way fiber looks very very similar um, in so much as again the linear barcode on there was more of a packaging barcode it wasn't being utilized by customers so we're going straight into 2d with this product and you will see it's very similar to Zaproton with the, the same G10 expiry date and lot number on there. And again, rebranding with the Baxalta. Rixubis is also going to be rebranded into Baxalta and this one is already on 2D, similar to Advate. So all the changes that you will see on this will be the Baxalta and then also the fact that the expiry date will be changed into year, month, date rather than day, month, year, which is what it is at the moment. So not a lot of changes here. And again, I've just used one size of the, the various sizes that we offer. So when will we see this in market? We're working on the timelines that we have to work through with an in-country reserve of three months, which is what we're contractually required to maintain. And also we keep around two to three months, depending on, on the product, to two to three months worth of working stock. So we expect to see around May 2016, June 2016, when you will see the new 2D barcoding packaging and the Baxalta branded on the fibers of Proton and Rexubus. So that's it. I'm not trying to keep it short and sweet because I thought you're going to see a lot of boxes, a lot of barcodes. So <laughs> thank you. Any questions on, on Baxalta products or when you'll see these? Fabulous. <laughs> that's what I like. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to invite Louise Misso. Um, she's come um, to talk to us about what's happening with products from Pfizer. Thank you, Louise. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, normally, people actually take the microphone away from me and say that you don't actually need that, so I'll try not to be as loud and boisterous as I, as I can be. And I'll be quite short and, and quick as well. Um, basically, Pfizer have got two products that will be affected by the barcoding changes, and that is Benefix and Zintha for Factor Eight and Factor Nine. Um, and at the moment, I haven't got any pictures demonstrating the products and where they'll be, but they'll be similar to the other products that you've seen. Obviously, the barcode will be in the um, same format, and the um, GTN serial number, lot expiry, etc., will all be printed next to them. And we will, I can actually provide some um, examples. I can send them up to the MBA, and they can provide them to anybody who actually would like examples of them as well. Um, so, basically, looking at uh, the timing for both Benefix and Zintra at the moment, we're looking at um, June 2016. Um, as the implementation dates for all, all of those um, uh, 2D barcodes. We'll be maintaining the transition labels ongoing. Uh, we share our 
um, packaging with the New Zealand market and as they've not moved across to the 2D data matrix format as yet, we'll be maintaining um, that barcode, the uh, original linear barcode on the packaging as well as the 2D data matrix barcode. But as I said, I can send examples to um, Rebecca and she can distribute them to anybody who would like some copies of those. Um, so, and at any point in time, uh, we will we'll also send, as we get closer to this date, we'll send out um, further updates as to the exact changeovers for each of the SKUs. Um, they are obviously affected by um, the ICR um, requirements that we have and also we also maintain um, a around about a two month working inventory and it's all dependent on um, how much demand there is between now and that period as to what particular SKU um, will change over first. Obviously some of the smaller SKUs that are used more frequently in surgery sort of have little spikes and so we think we've got quite a lot of inventory and then we have a couple of big surgeries and that goes down so they just sort of swap and change a little bit but um, we'll keep um, the MBA updated and, and um, I'll have my contact details there as well if anybody actually would like to contact me directly I can let you know um, at any point in time whenever you need to know as well. That's it for me, unless there are any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll move on to Griffles. So Griffles, um, we actually on our uh, website, as Louise just mentioned, we will be receiving um, updates about barcodes uh, like uh, templates or um, examples and we'll put them on the website. At the moment we do have an example from Griffles on our website that people can use to um, scan in um, and test for their systems and their barcode scanner. So I'll hand over to Ryan who will give us an update on what's happening with Griffles. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, the MBA for the opportunity firstly to, to present today. Um, I just want to provide a bit of detail around uh, the barcode symbology contained within Griffol's IVIG products. Um, Flebe Gamma Diff 50 milligrams per mil and 100 milligrams per mil. Um, these are both available under the new supply arrangements, um, the Australian National Blood Supply. Okay, so just a, just a little bit of background on Griffols for those of you who don't know. Um, we're a global company and we've been committed to serving people's health uh, since 1940. Um, today we employ almost 14,000 people globally, um, we're represented in over 100 countries. Um, this year is actually quite significant, we celebrate our 75th year. Um, in the development of life-saving plasma medicines, hospital pharmacy products and diagnostic technology for clinical use. Every day more than 25,000 individuals donate plasma at 150 Griffoles plasma donation centres across the US and this actually forms the largest plasma collection platform in the world. Um, all of our donors meet stringent health and lifestyle criteria and only plasma from qualified repeat donors is used in the production of our medicines. All of our donor centres maintain IQPP, the International Quality Plasma Program accreditation. So Flebo Gamma Diff, it's available from November 1st under the new supply arrangements. Available in both 50 milligram per mil and 100 milligram per mil formats. Concentrations, we have five volumes in 50 milligram per mil. The 20 gram, the 10, 5, 2.5 and 0.5. And the 100 milligram per mil, we have the 20 gram, 10 and 5 gram. All of these products have an expiry of two years to be stored at less than 30 degrees Celsius, protected from light and not frozen. Flebogamma diff product cartons are sealed with a holographic safety sticker. The individual vials are laser etched with a lot number and expiry date. Um, these vials, vials also include an integrated bottle hanger, peel away duplicate label for ease of use and administration. Okay, so the Flebogamma Diff product carton itself, um, pleased to say from the transition date of 1st of November, um, both the linear and 2D data matrix symbology uh, will be included. 
Um, as illustrated, this includes the global trade item number, the lot number and expiry date in both barcode and i-readable formats. Um, and as Rebecca said, the uh, barcode map is currently available on, our web on, on the NBA website. Um, and we've got hard copies here with the uh, Bioscience commercial team for those, uh, for those of you who want copies. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody got any questions for Ryan? Yes, hi, Dimmy. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just get you speaking to the microphone. Yep. Palette size, okay. Uh, so, as I understand, it'll be standardised. Um, so, across. Sorry. Are you looking to barcode pallets, like all the way up, serialise them, all the way to the pallet? Correct. Yeah. So each outside should have a GT number on it. Yeah. Which is different to the GT number for the final product. Yeah. This is Bruno, he's from Griffles yeah, also. So, <laughs> so yeah, for the purpose of this presentation I focused on the product carton. Obviously the vial itself is, is for, for next year and, and anything outside of that I think we can elaborate more on if you want to reach out after the presentation. Yeah, that would be great. Yep. I guess um, blood service finds a lot of um, efficiencies in having serialisation to the colour. Right. Um, because of the amount of features. So. Okay, I'll talk to you after. Wonderful. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Any other questions? Thanks. All right. So we're on to our last presentation of the day, Lucky CSL. Thank you so much. David will be David McClure has come up from, from Melbourne today um, and will give you an update on what's happening with CSL bearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, from a CSL perspective, the story is very similar. And I guess we're talking packaging and barcodes and standardisation, so um, it's not going to differ a hell of a lot. But um, from a CSL perspective, um, I just thought it was worth sort of talking through what we currently have as barcodes, and I wasn't sure of the exact audience, uh, but talking through what we have currently, because there's a lot of barcodes that have been around for a lot of years. Um, from a CSL point of view, we have on a lot of our products that have been around for quite some time a coda bar and barcode. Um, we also have products with data matrix and we also have products with sort of a GS1128 standard uh, on them. So um, if you look across our range of products and our commercial products uh, have some of the, the newer formats, um, our toll or uh, the products that are part of the fractionation agreement um, have the coda bar. So, I'll just walk you through the Coda Bar system for, for those that are uh, unfamiliar with it. It has been around, I think it was developed originally in 1972, so it's been around for a while. Um, it was a joint uh, development with the, the blood service, I think greater than 25 years ago, around getting something that was uh, an efficient trans, trans, transition or transfer of information from um, CSL through to the blood service and, and through to hospitals. Uh, it was linear, so um, it basically read the number straight off the barcode. It broke up into chunks and loaded into blood service database. So it was uh, you know, fairly basic, but we have been doing this for, for quite some time, and that's uh, one of the standards that, that's on a lot of our products. Um, from a data matrix perspective, we will have a, a phased transition to this system. Um, the first product that we'll have is, is a product that uh, launches from the 1st of November, uh, a Privagen product. Um, we'll have that GS1 data matrix on it and it will be encoded with the G10 expiry date, batch lot number. Sort of familiar theme really, isn't it? Um, we also have, it's not an, an NBA requirement, but it's, it's something that we have a standard within our production process where we're using a 128 barcode that's just storing the GTIN. And I guess my, my point about putting some of this information up is you will see pack, packs with multiple barcodes on them and having a bit of an understanding of sort of the history and which barcode is which uh, hopefully will help uh, in the field when, uh, when people are using this. If we look at our packs, um, I've got pack photos here of product with the data matrix on it. This is our Privagen product. So we've printed it on, the, I think, a lot of um, the feedback that we got from Europe and US in relation to the data matrix is 
both from a production perspective and a use in field perspective, having it on the top of the, the carton uh, is, is the place to have it. So um, this is our Privagen product, um, data matrix on the top, and you can see on, on this side where the GS1128, and again, just really so you get an understanding of um, which codes are which and, and where they're placed on the carton. Again, a uh, new product for us, the Hazantra, or coming into Australia, it's new at least. Um, currently, it only has uh, a 128 on it at the, the back of the carton, um, and uh, probably fairly early next year, we'll be phasing in uh, the data matrix. Again, we'll be on top of that carton uh, as that phases in next year. Getting to our fractionation agreement products, um, and this is just one example of that, the, uh, the Intragam P, which is probably our major product uh, in this area. Currently we have a coder bar um, barcode, you can see on, on, the side of the pack, on the side of the pack, which is the rear of the pack, into the rear of the pack. Um, and that will be staying, uh, we'll be dual coding uh, when we get up and running with um, the data matrix. And we plan to put data matrix uh, on the top of the cart. And one of the issues that we've identified that, uh, and we're wrestling with artwork, we do have some of our um, smaller volume products have quite small cartons and uh, we're just looking at where the best place to place the, uh, the, code of, uh, the, the data matrix on those cartons. You start to get on a small carton a bit tight from a real estate perspective once you've covered uh, uh, your uh, requirements from a, a labelling perspective. So. Uh, we've still got some work to do there, but we're making good progress. So in terms of the serialisation project, no, there hasn't been a, a, a lot of discussion about serialisation. I've personally got a couple of questions around, around that for, uh, from an MBA requirements perspective. But um, we have, uh, within CSL, some global experience on serialisation and uh, we're getting support from our global team um, that have worked in the US and Europe and will be supporting us in Australia on serialisation. It's, it's quite a complex, it's easy to say, it's actually quite hard to do. There's, um, it's quite a complex process within a manufacturing environment um, to implement serialisation in its sort of truest form right the way from uh, you know, the, the carton right the way through to, uh, to pallets. So um, we'll be uh, leveraging as much knowledge and uh, um, I guess learning from the mistakes of, uh, of our colleagues in, in the US and, and Europe on this. It is a demanding engineering data and process solution so um, we have that support from a local team perspective. The local project team um, is addressing the Australian requirements um, basically from uh, the NBA. Uh, we've worked through our project scope, um, we've got equipment requirements uh, and production line upgrades to do to transition all of our products across and you know as you guys have talked about there's quite a lot of packaging artwork changes and barcode placement uh, work that we need to work through. So in terms of transition um, I guess my first point was just to reassure everyone that uh, we're going to continue to use the coder bar and I've already had some conversations with, uh, um, with some people in hospitals about um, the code of bar, they're a bit concerned it's going to disappear before they're ready. Uh, I just wanted to reassure everyone that the code of bar barcode will stay there uh, through the entire transition period and, uh, and it'll be dual, dual coded um, once the data matrix starts coming in on those uh, um, data, on the, sorry, on the, the toll products. Questions? Yes? Hi there, I'm Mary from the Children's and Women's in Melbourne. We mm -hmm. have a lot of CSL products and the, we have a hemophilia treatment service, so we have a lot of everyone else's products as well. What worries me is, and this might be a question more for the MBA um, and you together, when I order um, 60 bottles of Alpimex, I'm not going to have to wand in every 60 every one of those bottles when I get it into inventory, am I? Is that what the serialisation means? How will we be able to discern the difference between, you know, what's in a box of 10 as opposed to, um, you know, individual? Will there be two barcodes that will do that job? Will I be barcoding two different places on the box? Or do you understand what I'm trying to get to? Um, 
Yes, I think. So you're talking about a, an individual carton yes. that has 10 individual yeah. vials How in that carton? How that carton into the blood bank? It's probably a combination question between myself and, and you guys. Um, in terms of the, uh, the carton itself, it, once we get to serialisation, um, in theory at least, you can scan the code that's on the carton and if the individual vials are also serialised, then you should be able to read from that, um, assuming that you've got the right sort of technology and linkages from a data perspective, you should be able to read the individual data off those vials. My understanding of the process, I'm not sure that the NBA is designating to that level and going to use it that way. So um, certainly that's one of my questions to the NBA is, is around the individual vial serialisation and that's uh, an area that we need to get to the bottom of. Because it doesn't just apply to Albumix, say, um, the Albumix that currently comes in cartons, but I'm thinking more about my uh, neonatal patients. At the moment, we don't... Um, the small vials of albumin that used to come packaged together with, you know, in a cellophane package, you used to be able to, you know, just um, assume that everything in the, in the package was the one batch. The fact that you actually send them to us all individually now, like all 60 or 70, and we have to check every single one of those boxes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that you'll be facilitating the customer by actually, you know, putting things of the same batch. Certainly they'll be the same batch. Right. So you're yes. continuing with the same thing. Uh, I guess this is an understanding of what serialisation is as opposed to um, barcoding and batch numbering. So uh, um, it's probably, I'm not sure I'm necessarily fully qualified to, to talk serialisation and maybe it's <coughs> a conversation we'd have off, offline, but um, in terms of the, the product that comes in, in, in groups or in boxes will be of the same batch. Um, when you get to serialisation, each of those individual cartons will have a, uh, a unique identifying number. So to read that unique identifier number, yes, you'll have to scan every single one of them. Great. <laughs> so, I mean, this is really a question for both the NBA and the Australian Red Cross Blood Service and all of the suppliers, because if we get a box and, we, and we're going to be holding inventory of IBIG, uh, we under the new blood star uh, arrangements. So if we get, uh, you know, say IBIG comes in a box of 10 of a particular size and it comes in a cardboard carton and then it's serialised inside, is there, do we have to then make sure that our laboratory information system can, can then cope with the barcode on the outside which has got a serialisation number that maybe talks to what still says that there's, you know, that there's... What's, what's actually in there. I mean, that's that's really... Otherwise, if I've got a one each individual mm -hmm. one... Um the, the current requirement, NBA requirement, uh, is that it's uh, barcoded at or data matrix at a carton level. So if there's one unit in that carton, then and, and that carton is serialised, then you'll have to zap every carton. If there's 10 units in a carton and the serialisation is at the carton level, then you'll have to zap every 10 packs. But the requirement doesn't require for a box of ship or a shipper size, which is, you know, I guess anything up to 100 vials potentially. Uh, there's no requirement to um, uh, to run a data matrix or a, 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 um, a barcode process at that level. It's only at the carton level is where the requirement so sits. The means the individual this is what we would ship it from the factory to um, the blood service. In terms of definitions, are we talking about a vial is inside a carton? Yes. Okay. So a, a carton's the so is vial inside a carton, carton inside a shipper. So and so the shipper level is not bar there's no requirement for it to be barcoded or serialised at this point in time. That's correct. Yeah, when you get 180 products coming through with all this, that's not going to be time consuming at all. So, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, we totally understand that it's time consuming, but it's for a data traceability, um, heaven forbid, sure. recall. Make it easy for us. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah so well, maybe we, the NBA should make it easy. Mm. 
for the so working with the blood service to then maybe change the way we order so that we order, I don't know, carton, you know, the bigger package size rather than individual vials. Okay, that's true. We can definitely look into that. And but I mean, this is why these conversations are so great because for serialisation in particular, we're having this conversation very early because serialisation is not a requirement until 2017. Um, so that's something we can definitely look at to oh. be able to make changes in blood net perhaps. I think from a, from a manufacturer's perspective, the serial, and whilst serialisation sounds like it's a long way off, it is quite, you know, if we move from serialising a carton to serialising a pallet, it is an enormous task from a manufacturer's perspective. And I, I manufacturer? Yeah. I mean, I, it's, um, it's something that we would want to be having those discussions if we're changing from the current standard. We would be having those discussions fairly quickly because it's, uh, it is a significant difference. Um, I understand where you're coming from, and I think you know part of the GS1 standards uh, um, go towards reducing the workload that you're talking about. But at the moment, the requirement from the, the NBA doesn't go to that length level. Hi, David. So we've got serialisation on single farm. Um, then in the box of 10, we've got serialisation from 0 to 9 or 1 to 10. But each of those has got the patch number on it. Is that correct? As well as the serialisation number? Yes, yes. That's correct. Currently, people will only use the patch number. Yes. So the serialisation number may be put to the red herring at this stage. From the point of view of the way that people currently have the product. If they want to be individual, like the blood donation number, then the serialisation number can be useful without getting the hands on them and scanning each individual unit. Correct? So they just carry on using the batch number as they do now to issue batch 1, 2, 3 to patient Jeremy, 1, 2, 3 to patient Smith, they can continue to do so. Yeah, I, from my point of view, the answer is yes. I guess the, the question you're asking is, is what is the value of serialisation? Um, and, and why are we going to the level of serialisation is, is the question you're asking. Can you get what you currently get from a data matrix barcode? And the answer is yes, you can. Serialisation adds a, another dimension to that. Yeah, just to answer the question about the packaging, if, if a 10 count comes in and has a box of 10, the same batch number and the seal is still intact and when it leaves the blood surface then it's basically a guarantee that the 10 vials inside should be the same batch number or well, the different serial number but we're not using that to work like that. So our customers are all in batches that fit inside a sealed box that arise from the cell or the other manufacturers. They shouldn't be using to scan the digital vials. But currently, David, when we receive product from CSL or when we receive a go by the blood service, and we scan it into blood net to say we've received it. Mm. We don't type in batch one, two, three. We scan the barcode and it only chops it at the batch level and it says, yes, you've received 20, you know, 20 vials of that. So what I'm saying is, will I still be scanning one barcode, mm. which will chop at the batch, or will it actually, do I have to scan in all 20 bottles that I've received from CSL? That's what I don't understand. And serialisation is actually would be really helpful because at the moment, you know, it's really hard to trace which particular uh, uh, bottle of Albumix 4, for example, uh, is issued to a patient and then comes back. And uh, LIS isn't terribly good at, at managing all of that. But when we, you know, that we do need to be able to actually work out that it was this particular bottle that went to that particular patient and, and was actually transfused to that patient or came back to us and, and we can actually trace that because, you know, it's one of the really big problems in uh, traceability of the manufactured pro pro uh, products with that, with, you know, our general and very laboratory information. Is, is that at a bo bottle level or a batch level? Mm. Are you well, at the moment we do a batch level, but, yep. can't, but the serialisation will allow it to be at a bottle level. Yeah, and that it's is the point, is mm. the traceability yes. of what, what has been infused into the patient. Yes. So we can see that, yep, it was this bottle in particular mm. that has been transfused into that patient, which is why we are going down the track of serialisation. So why would you care what bottle it was if it's all from the same batch? 
then the, the constituents of it is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter whether it's number one or number nine, it should be the same product. So why, what does it matter as long as I've got the batch number recorded? I, I, I think it's because it's given an extra level of traceability in terms of individual vials to a patient. But, but, but it doesn't add safety because it's the same, same product. No, it does because if I issue it to my patient and uh, it's, you know, the patient that has been on the ward, for all day and the patient just doesn't turn up for my IVIG and then, the and then comes back, whether it comes back into the fridge and hopefully there will be RFID traceability and these things as well, um, but then I need to know whether, how it's been stored uh, and, and what actually happened to that, whether it was assigned to multiple patients, mm -hmm. uh, you know, se sequentially or, or, or um, you know, and whether that contributed to have, perhaps to an adverse event to the final patient or not. So it's actually really important. RFID with them as would actually be very nice as well. Why are we talking big blue sky? <laughs> So, uh, from my point of view, that explains the serialisation. I think that's a benefit. I mean, I've, I've been struggling to understand uh, the serialisation argument. Um, that explains to me why you'd want to serialise at that level. Yeah, hi, Jimmy. I was wondering that the has blood now already defined. Does the NBA uh, know what information from the data matrix it requires? So it's going back to the question earlier. Is it all four pieces of information or just the batch? What, what's NBA's expectations for blood net? To be honest, I'm going to have to take that question offline and ask Peter because it's in his brain. Um, and I will probably just email everyone because I'm not completely sure. But I do know that there are plans that have been done with the development team about what needs to be changed for blood net for barcoding um, and that that work is, um, I don't know, if, if I think planning has begun for that work but there's no um, complete work that's been yeah, undertaken I mean, in the right system. But there are yes, you're right. Process, process changes required, so like what we're yes, today. you're right. But so I will, I will put an update um, on the barcoding page of the MBA about what's the status of, for blood net. Hi, David. So I took these questions come from my experience as a plant manager in the hospital, my current role in the service. Uh, just with Helen's uh, point there, we'll be sent a vial out to David Jones, uh, and today you have a lot of problems with me, and today. Um, <laughs> if you give you David Jones to that example, and it came to come back, you could presume essentially that that vial wasn't used on David Jones. But if you sent uh, two vials out, Serialized numbers, number one to David Jones and number two to uh, David Bosby for the same um, And one vial comes back, you can't make a presumption as to which patient it went to. Um, because the technology doesn't continue through to the patient's arm. So that's the danger that you may have watched more serialization units uh, necessarily. Well, we're introducing an electronic medical record, we will be actually taking you through to the patient's arm. It's not the yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that is the, the, the great vision in terms of the use of traceability to patient you know, level in terms yeah. of having a barcode um, and even with it with the caregiver also having a barcode ID to employ that end-to-end -end traceability. Um, just just touching on a couple of points. The question about the, the, the use and changes to is it BloodNet, the system? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's a key question in terms of what the practice and the expectations um, are going to be um, on those users and the, and the use of, of the information within the barcodes. Um, one last thing, I'm not doing a, a, a GS1 pitch, but I did bring along some handouts which are, they, they fold out to a, a four, four sides of A4, which show the end-to-end -end, um, use and application of a barcode from manufacturing perspective through to um, you know, actually dispensing and, and um, giving the patient the, the product and, and what the links are in terms of the use of serialization and linking it back to the patient, linking it back to the um, healthcare provider as well. So I, I do have those with me if anyone would like to just take them away. Um, it is a good visual journey in terms of the vision. Yes, we're not all there yet, and we don't all have the technology, but it is the, the vision of um, you know, NITA, <coughs> the National E-Health Transition Authority, who we work very closely with. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, um, I have another question. Yeah. Is, will this 2D bar <coughs> uh, be on the peel off label yeah. that, that will go into the patient's uh, history? Because you know, that peel off label, which is on all, certainly on, on most manifestations, except for mm -hmm. prosromanies, um, uh, uh, that actually then goes into, onto the patient's medical record. And uh, and that then in most cases is you know scanned into their into their electronic records. Certainly. Certainly, um, that's what we're looking at at the moment. I mean, there's issues around the size of the code, what we can fit uh, on those, but we're, we're working through that at the moment from an artwork perspective to see what we can get on there and what we can't. And I, I guess when we get to the stage of, um, of being confident that we need to do it on a you know, reliable basis uh, or not, then uh, if, if the answer's not, then we'll be having discussions with the NBA about uh, what our process is moving. And I'm assuming that that would be a discussion with uh, the service as well. So I, the, the answer is yes, the target is to do that, but that there may be some technical issues around that. Kirk Sminsky, Pathology West. My question is, is if we're going to be using serialisation and you're going to be using it for a whole batch, how big is this number going to be, the serialisation number going to grow? And how easy is that going to be to make clerical errors with? I mean, it's, you, you could it's say we're talking you know, six, seven, eight, nine-digit uh, number. Uh, I can't remember the exact number. It's around about 10, 11, yeah. 12. But the, the, the number of combinations based on serialisation by each supplier um, combined with GTIN, which is a unique identifier, gives you countless combinations. But in terms of capturing that in an LIS, you need to capture it in an LIS field. So how how big does that field need to be? And if you were to look in an LIS system, yeah. how big is that number? So because that's going to mean you're going to have to try and trace that big number potentially back to some paperwork. If you know, if you say have gone into a downtime situation. Yeah. You know, there's implications there. We, we do trust our LISs, but they do go down occasionally and we need to um, use manual processes. Yes. So what impact do you think that will have? I think this is where there's also the need for the inclusion of human readable, but there's still that um, mm -hmm. element that is there. It's, it doesn't just require a scan. It is there for the human eye also. But you still need to write it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, 10, 11, 12 digits. Can you imagine how many mistakes? We currently make mistakes with eight. And, and it yeah, will be in that order. I'm concerned about going from a seven to a 13 digit number and how we, you know, how we're going to maintain that number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And reducing tra or keeping low transcription errors. I mean, it's. I agree with the principle. I think that serialisation is fantastic. I just think it's, it's it's a big thing to overcome. I mean, particularly when you're looking at your LIS and how you actually use that and how the LIS uses it. Um, yeah. I don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just up the back, please. If we've got products then with an expiry date which is the way around. to the um, to the you know the other to the fresh products. We've already got the, the mismatch of um, expiry date formats with Octagon and the various other things at the mm -hmm. moment and the other you know hematology products that we get and you have to check. I mean some of them just have, you know, two oh one six slash seventeen or, 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 or you know, oh seven for you know day year and month and 
So we, we're used to dealing with that, but it's, that's inconvenient for you. Uh, and you usually have to interpret that for your LIS. So you, that's when you're putting the new badge in, you have to hand type it in and hopefully not get it wrong, because if you get it wrong, you can't fix it in our system mm. anyway. Mm. Yeah. So we, we are, we, yes, changing it, it will be something to get used to, but we, we already deal with that sort mm. of the i-readable batch number? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, there will still be an i-readable batch number. Working with many country hospitals that do not have any IT, everything's handwritten. Okay. Yeah, no, there's still a, there's requirements about what needs to be i-readable. I think potentially, uh, just from a CSL <coughs> products perspective and the, the CODABAR um, system, I'm not sure what you, from a uh, in-hospital use perspective, um, whether you're capturing is this the last five digits of what we would consider a lot number, but the lot number in future really uh, in under a um, data matrix system will be a 10-digit 10 10 digit number. Any other questions that we can? Hi. Hi, sorry, I'm Michael Doherty from CERN. I know Liz Bennett here. Um, I was just wondering one question. Um, we've got the four standard pieces of information that were included in the barcode. Um, to any of the manufacturers, there was a disclosure, I think, that they could potentially use other fields. Um, as well within the 2D barcode. Was there any intent from anyone to include further information into the 2D barcode? Yeah. So we can open that to the floor to any other of the suppliers as well? Yeah. Elise? Hi, it's Elise from Pfizer. Um, we haven't looked specifically at this point in time in including specific data in, but it's something that we do have on um, some of our other products and things is, um, as was referred to, I think it was um, the gentleman who was doing the GS1 presentation, that um, we actually have in some, we have instructional videos in those barcodes. So that's something that we have considered going forward, um, so that would be um, instructional use videos for the specific product to be included in those barcodes. But it's not something that we've actually looked at specifically for this transition at, at this point in time, but it's one of the things that we're looking at in back salter. Yeah. Any other suppliers have CSL we have no plans uh, other than what's required at this point in time. No, I just wanted to kind of see because from the manufacturer's perspective, we all know it's kind of a long process to try and get this in, so I just want yeah. to see if anything is on the horizon that we can take on time. I think the, tr the trick is getting the capability in the first place of the, the serialisation, the, really the, the, the difficult piece is serialisation, um, then adding additional data once you've got that in place is, uh, is not that difficult. You know, I've just been chatting and we didn't realise it might be snuck in. So how are you going to deal with serialisation? It's 
good to know because if you're, are you working on it or have you started work? Well, uh, the first thing is that there's coming here and actually saying what, what it is <laughs> and like that kind of proposed here. Yeah. And serialization is, is a big kind of area and that's something that we don't currently think from our loose system have the native capability for. So that's where we need to kind of um, look at what's um, required from there. That perspective. So we are going to need to, to look at from a development perspective what's required to. From the serialization point, and I'm not sure, sorry, I didn't quite understand the ultimate outcome of the answer that before. Um, but we do require serialization on the one individual cardinal bottle. Um, and we've confirmed that the larger pack of 30 RBMAX or whatever it may be, on that box itself, there won't be a 2D barcode that contains information about the serialization of there's, the There's no requirement from the NBA to serialize at that shipper level. Yeah. Anything over the, the serialized at a carton, which is, you know, if it's a carton, it might be a carton of 10 or a carton of 1, but anything over that, there's, there's no requirement. Okay, well, thanks for that. Based on Michael's answer, that then raises the next question that who's going to be funding the cost for serialization in terms of, you know, as end users, we're going to need the CERNA to do an extensive amount of work, and who's who's going to be absorbing the cost for this project? Like in terms of writing the program, the computer programs, with you know, a lot of money involved, you know, where's it going to come from? Yeah, I know Peter and Nathan, who are back at the NBA, work very closely with all of the LIS providers because of the BloodNet LIS interface work that keeps going on. So we will, I will bring that question back to them to, for them to liaise with each LIS that's in within Australia um, and for them to understand what the costs are from an LIS and spend perspective and to work with them on behalf of that. So I don't know the answer at this time, but I'll definitely bring it up. Yeah, the, the, my fear would be that that cost may be passed on to the end users. Yeah, so, okay. and, and that's quite scary, really. Yeah, we get mandated okay. that we have to do something and it costs us a bomb to have to do it. Yeah, I understand that. So I'll make sure I bring it up and, and relay those concerns. Any other questions we can take at this time? Open to anybody who has presented today. If you feel something you can remember now. It's amazing to have this group of people in the room. I don't know if ever been anywhere to compare these being uh, manufactured product suppliers, uh, LIS people, NBA people, who's in the ICS, and then users. It's just wow. Just for you, Helen. Yes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know that uh, some people have travelled here specifically and some people have stayed up for HIA and it was a pretty big conference, so really appreciate that. There will be a video available online, so we have recorded today, um, and if you wanted to um, pass that on to any colleagues, it will be available on the NBA website within about two weeks. <laughs>